What's up, y'all? You're watching my favorite YouTube channel, Life Study Library. This is your host, Lai Yosh. Uh, people, this is really happening. I finally got up from my couch of laziness and made this video about how to make good habits and how to break bad habits. How many of you have had to struggle through a bad habit that you wanted to get out of, like eating poorly, over drinking, and how many of you had to struggle through developing a good habit, like being able to face the desk and start hitting your books, or you struggled with always unconsciously avoiding that hottie over there, even though you two work at the same place and even though you are clearly attracted to that person. Yes, the list goes on and there are just so many videos on YouTube talking about how to make and break habits, so much so that I almost didn't feel like making my own video, but here I am, so yeah, about time, huh? In this channel, you'll be able to learn these interesting and life-changing scientific and psychological information that might have a great impact on your life and I'll be using scientific and scholarly studies to support what will be said here so if you want to learn about these interesting science and psychology then make sure to like this video and subscribe to life study library in this particular video we'll be discussing the long-awaited topic how to scientifically make and break habits we humans are pretty much beings that are dictated by habits. If we figure out that eating ice cream makes us feel happy and satisfied, we'll keep eating ice cream until we die. And if we figure out that running makes you tired and miserable, we'll never run until the day we die. And the typical thing that you usually hear, things like eating too much ice cream will make you feel sick, it's bad for you, or running makes you more healthy so you should go outside and run. Logics and reasons like these aren't actually very useful when trying to make them into a habit and make them into a repeated behavior. And advices like, you need to have motivation or willpower, then you can make anything into a habit or break any bad habits. I've already talked about why this is also horrible advice when attempting habit making and breaking in many of my previous videos, so I'll summarize it. Basically, we are animals that cannot beat desires, at least not completely. We have our primal desires that all living things have, so things like eating desires, sleeping desires, sexual desires, aspects of life we need in order to survive. On top of that, we have our social and personal desires. Namely, The Path of Least Resistance, books like Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, which can be checked in the Amazon link in my description, so check it out if you're interested. Uh, one of the key takeaways from this book is that people are susceptible to nudges. When we see a fast food restaurant when we're hungry, we're more likely to be nudged into getting lured into that fast food restaurant. We get nudged into making a less healthier choice than people who are not hungry and thus do not feel the need to go to the fast food restaurant. What I'm saying here is that we are super gullible to temptations, and this goes beyond our primal needs, and a no-brainer example of this is things like going to our phones when we really should be doing more important tasks. So in summary, uh, I first want y'all to understand that when it comes to bad habits, you really shouldn't feel personally embarrassed and think as if you're a failure or anything like that. You don't need to feel this way because scientifically, it's definitely not a flaw for you to be doing these activities because it's your natural behavior as an animal. You are a living organism before you are human, if that makes sense at all. So how can we solve this issue? Well, that's what I'm talking about in this video. Today, I'll introduce you to techniques that are all scientifically proven, and I thought I was going to make them into a ranking list, but since different methods work for different people better, I'll simply put them in the list form. And as for you, I really suggest you to try all these techniques out and see which one you can do the best and the easiest. So without further ado, let's go. All right, so number one, in order to make good and new habits and break old and bad habits, learn the trigger of your habit. So what is the trigger? Let me explain. Honestly, this is an easy starter. So let's say you want to make a new habit of uh, reading books or something. And the reason why, oh, I can solve this issue by not touching my phone when I'm reading. The reason why this won't work, or I should say the reason why this is an unreliable method is because on the first few days, you might be able to do this goal and may even keep a short continuous streak by using willpower to not get distracted and continue your habit. But there will be those days when you forget 
or you just don't feel like reading, or something urgent comes out of the blue and once you come back home to pick up the book, the day's almost over. You might think things like this will not happen to you or you'll be able to be careful about it, but trust me, life's gonna rain on you all of a sudden and besides, don't you think it's always better to have a safety net, especially with things you deem as important that you want to keep a continuous habit of? So how can you actually scientifically combat this? The answer is to think about what you tend to do right before you do your bad habits. Let's say you get distracted on your phone because right after you come back from work or something, you go, ah, I'm so tired. And then you go lay on your bed and open your phone. By the time this happens, it's already too late because now since the option of laying on your bed and looking at your phone becomes available, you know, because you're holding it in your hand right now, it'll be super, super, super hard for you to consciously turn it off and put it away and get back to whatever you were doing before. If it's not difficult to put it away, then it really shouldn't become a problem in the first place if you can consciously do so, at least within the scenario of wasting time on your phone after you come back from work. Getting distracted by it won't be a habit issue for you. But back to what I was saying before, the reason why looking at the trigger is useful. So say for example you observe yourself and see that your trigger that makes your hand unconsciously move towards your phone is because you have your uh, phone charger right beside your bed. So after you finish your day and get ready for bed and you lay down and you plug your phone and then because you have your phone charging right beside you when you're actually supposed to be counting sheeps you'll be looking at the notifications and all the social media and all that and after you realize oh no I've done it again at that point it's like 2 a.m. Ever had that experience? Yeah I thought so I have too. So here you can say that the trigger is the act of plugging your phone to a charger that's near your bed. So I think you all know what to do next. Place your charger somewhere, anywhere that's not within your reach from your bed. Maybe like at the other corner of your bedroom or something. If you're lucky, there will be another plug that's unused at the other corner of the room so you can plug your charger over there. If you're not so lucky and the only charger that you have in your bedroom is the one that's right next to your bed, then I recommend you get a power strip so you can place the outlet and also the many other outlets that come with the strip to the other side of the room. By doing so, you'll have enough space between your phone and your bed that disables you from actually laying in bed while using your phone. And once you hop in bed and you don't have any distractions, the only thing left for you is to count sheeps. And yes, I do understand that that was only one rough example, and your room might not allow all of what I just said to happen. But my point is that by observing your daily life that surrounds your negative habit, you'll be able to find a trigger that directly or indirectly leads you to do that negative habit, which is also known as a cue. And by changing your behavior and eliminating that cue between yourself and the bad habit, you'll be able to stop doing it all without using any amount of your emotional energy like willpower. So that was the first method you can incorporate in your life to stop a negative habit. And now let's talk about the next one. So this example with your phone, many of you might be able to realize how to do the method fairly quickly, or you'll probably be able to understand the value of it. But I'm also aware that life is really this simple and easy, and things like your professional life or your social life will most likely be too complex for you to find this one point or one cue that can solve all the other aspects of the issue. For example, there are many moments in your life where you might get tempted to eat unhealthily or use your phone when you're supposed to be doing other stuff. So my point is that the most effective and efficient way to solve this issue is to observe and fix these many cues one by one. I guess you can also say that the answer to this issue is that if you try to fix these cues all at once, you will most definitely fail. So for example, some people might listen to my first point and say that, okay, so since I know that I have multiple cues that make me eat snacks within a day when I'm not supposed to, like when I'm bored, I eat snacks, and also uh, when I'm watching TV, I eat snacks, and I also eat snacks when I get out of the shower at night, so I can come up with a cue that can apply to all these situations and solve the entire problem all at once. If you thought about doing this, don't do it. It won't work. The reason why this won't work was proven in another study done at Danone Research on 2013, and this study collected 65 samples who were struggling with excessive eating on snacks. 
Oh, wait. Uh, it was actually 63 samples. Sorry about that. Just, uh, 63 female samples who were struggling with eating too much snacks. And the objective of the study was to see if the usage of the cue, if this technique really worked when trying to stop this negative habit of eating snacks. The first group focused on a single cue. When they were bored, for example, they would eat fruits instead of snacks. This group focused on looking on one cue at a time. The second group tried to do the same but with multiple cues simultaneously when they were bored or when they were studying, when they were watching TV or when they were feeling stressed. In all these moments, they would try to eat fruits instead of snacks and the third group did not change anything in their lifestyle and the results showed that even after only three days of observation, the group that focused on solving for one cue at a time found a significant decrease in snack consumption. However, the group that focused on fixing for multiple cues at once, they didn't show a significant decrease in snack consumption to a point where they weren't any different from the third group who didn't do anything. From this it can be said that when trying to make or break a habit, we can only be successful when we focus on one thing at a time, one moment of life at a time. Even if it's possible for us to focus on our habits during this one specific moment of the day, and even if that effort might coincidentally affect other parts of our lives, we're not able to deliberately make one action affect multiple parts of our lives when considering habits. We have to first focus on not eating snacks, specifically during the time when we feel bored during the day. And once we conquer that part of our day, only then we can move on to the snack eating problem during the nighttime or any other moment of your day. Now, the reason for this can stem from multiple sources. It could be another supporting evidence that proves we are not able to multitask. It could connect to that in some way too. But the point is, when you want to make or break a habit, you shouldn't be looking for a single all-curing method. And thus, when you see that you're successful in your habit at one part of your day, but often fail to do so in during another part of your day, you have no reason to feel discouraged. When you see that you can successfully reject a temptation to eat snacks or become lazy to do work, when you can reject a temptation during the day, but often fall to the temptation during the nighttime, you shouldn't feel like you are a failure. I know I'm repeating, but I need to make sure this message gets to you. When you want to make or break a habit, don't try to find and fix multiple cues at the same time. Instead, focus on one cue at a time and focus on single tasking in order to successfully overcome bad habits and grow good habits. And while we're at it, this is slightly off topic, but I have another uh, book recommendation that you might want to read. If you want to learn about why, despite the popularity, the act of multitasking is actually bad for you. The book is called Single Tasking, Get More Done One Thing at a Time by Deborah Zak. This book straight up picks a fight with the common notion of multitasking and win using scientific evidence and also how we evolved as human species to tell you the truth that despite you thinking that you can juggle two or three activities at the same time, you are simply fooling yourself. Not only do you get slower at doing all these multiple activities, but you will also make more mistakes while doing them. If you want to learn more about this, then go check the link in my description. But for now, let me conclude this part with this explanation. When trying to fix a habit, you will most likely find multiple cues that you feel like you can fix all at once. But what you actually should do is not try to think, I'll throw away all my snacks and desserts that are in my fridge and in the freezer and in the pantry and from the garage. But rather, you should be thinking like, okay, so since I get all my snacks from Safely nearby and I would most definitely get tempted to buy snacks if I walk down the snacks aisle in, in Safeway, so either I can change stores and I can do my groceries at at Whole Foods instead of Safeway and buy stuff from there. Or the more likely scenario would be that I would just not walk down the aisle of in Safeway where they always store the snacks so I don't have to see them. And if I don't see the snacks, I probably won't get reminded of them and I probably won't buy them. You see what I'm talking about here? You focus on finding the most vital point where the queue gets activated. You focus on the single most vital point and use the counter cue method, I just came up with it just now, to solve the entire problem. 
you're still only using the same cue for the same intensity, but that one shot affects all other parts of the issue. Okay, now with all that conceptual part explained, I'll be talking about the specific technique. Yeah, I can already tell this video is going to be pretty long. Right now, I'll talk about a specific technique you can use in your life to eliminate bad habits. This habit eliminating technique is called paradoxical intervention. This can be of a great use when you're trying to erase bad habits and you do it by intentionally performing that bad habit. So like I said earlier, you tend to perform bad habits unintentionally on autopilot. You unintentionally eat snacks or unintentionally look at your phone for a long time or unintentionally fall asleep. Yeah, so the common source of your bad habits, you do them and cannot force yourself to stop them because you don't even think about it while you're doing it. So, this technique took the opposite route. You practice intentional participation in that bad habit, and you put your full attention when you slack off. So, if you're struggling with um, unconsciously using your phone for a long time, you deliberately set a certain time in your day specifically for slacking on in your phone. You make it so that, okay, at 1 p.m., I'm going to drop everything that I'm doing and spend 30 minutes on my phone, and I can't do anything else, any other activity whatsoever. I forbid myself from doing it. Or if you have a bad habit of napping too much, you set a rule that I'm going to intentionally take a nap at noon at 12 p.m., and I'm going to do this at this exact time every single day, even if I'm not sleepy. For 30 minutes, I can't do anything else besides lay on the couch and try to sleep. And with these types of activities, some people might think, okay, well, I'm a heavy sleeper and once I fall asleep, I can't get myself to wake up even if I use an alarm. I just stop the alarm and fall back asleep. These scenarios can be easily resolved by you being creative with where you put your alarm. For example, you can put your alarm at the opposite corner of your room where you're intentionally taking a nap so that when it goes off, you'll have to walk there, use energy to get there, and so by the time you stop the alarm, you've awoken too much to fall back asleep. And if you think that the opposite corner of your room is too short of a distance, like if you think you might just you know, walk back to your bed before you fully wake up. Then you can be a little bit more creative and maybe have uh, multiple alarms, like a trail of alarms throughout your house that has like a five second difference when going off so that you have to keep walking to stop like like five different alarms. And by the time you stop the last one, you're in the bathroom to wash your face and do your morning routine and fully wake up. Or you might just realize that, okay, I'm, I'm still sleepy, but since I'm already standing in front of the bathroom sink, I'm at as well as wash my face right now and wake myself up, Hansel and Gradle style. Except if you have a snack binging issue, then you don't want the trail of alarms to be leading to the snack pantry, or else that'll activate a whole other issue. So yeah, or another example would be uh, if your bad habit is like a stage fright and you see that your cue that starts your nervous feeling is that you start breathing fast or stutter before you get attention from the crowd. Then you can set aside a certain time within the day, like 10 or 15 minutes or so, to intentionally breathe fast or intentionally stutter in your speech. So the point is to intentionally perform that activity that you want to delete from your daily behavior. Because when you think about it, you do most of your negative habits on autopilot without you being conscious of it. So by you consciously doing these activities on purpose, this technique of paradoxical intervention will help you stop unconsciously perform bad habits. This technique was actually studied pretty vigorously in the 80s and was even studied by using meta-analysis and has proven to have significant amount of legitimacy as one method you can use in order to combat negative habits. According to the study, the basic idea to this technique is that you put a sense of obligation to your distracting activity. Or I guess a better word for it is a sense of control because you intentionally perform that negative habit. Whether it's shaking your hand frantically or eating snacks, you will be able to feel I'm shaking my hands right now, but I'm not in front of an audience, so that's weird. Oh, I see. I'm able to intentionally perform this negative behavior that I want to stop. That sense of control that you have regarding your negative behavior, according to the study, might be a technique you can use to overcome this negative behavior by using the paradoxical intervention. So in plain English, you make your negative habit a legitimate chore that you have to do. 
In this sense, the term self-control is not really about using your motivation to force yourself to do or stop a certain habit. Rather, it's a mere end result of you being able to control these habits, if that makes sense at all. And also, looking at the other side, when you want to make positive habits like studying or working on your whatever project, anything that you want to make it into a habit, you can use the paradoxical intervention in the opposite route. If you're struggling to make studying into a habit, for example, you can make a rule that states, I'm going to study for 10 minutes, and if I can do this every single day, then this alone should be enough. And then if and whenever I feel like doing more, those extra time will count as an add-on to my requirements, as extra credit. The key is to change your rule from, I must do this much, to, doing this much is enough. Right? If you force yourself by saying, I must do this much, you'll eventually have to rely on forcing your motivation to pull you up. Rather, if you set yourself a minimum goal and say that, uh, this is enough for the day, then the feeling of being forced to do extra work will be gone and hence, it increases the chance of you being motivated to do more. This is another form of paradoxical intervention. And the last thing I want to talk about is that it's important to make this technique itself into a habit, right? So it's not enough just for you to say to yourself, I feel like I want to procrastinate, so I'll procrastinate for 10 minutes. This isn't enough because you're still relying on your emotion, your motivation, your feeling to do the paradoxical intervention. Rather, what you should be doing is that, Oh, I see that it's a certain time of the day, it's it's 12 o'clock, I'll stop whatever I'm doing and get lazy. You have to set a certain time within the day to intentionally do the bad habit. And by incorporating this paradoxical intervention into your life, you might be able to see great results in your life and might be able to stop doing a negative habit and do a positive habit. Okay, so that was pretty much it for this video, how to make and break habits by using scientific technique. Thank you so much for watching until the end. I know it was a very long video and I'm very tired. So yeah, I'll end it quickly. Today's recommended video that you should go watch after finishing this video and maybe even take a break after. But after you take your break, I recommend you go watch some of my videos that are listed in my description section. They're all somewhat related to habit making and talk about specific aspects of habits in your life. Where many people might want to improve on. For example, one of the recommended video is called How to Make a Habit of Healthy Eating. It talks about this not so well known technique that you can use all without even thinking about motivation in order to make a healthy eating habit. I know it's a pretty bold statement but I have a good feeling what's said in this video is something very new to you and you'll probably gain a lot from watching this video so go check them out. And for my book recommendation, I also have a number of books in the same place in the description that specifically talks about habit making and breaking, how to make good habits and how to break bad habits, and which none of them relies on motivation or powering through, these types of fossil fuel techniques, but rather uses psychology and science that allows habit making and breaking into something that you can do effectively and efficiently, all without relying on emotional resources. If you're interested and want to learn more about the science of habit making and breaking, go check these books out and give it a read. These also might help you a lot too. And lastly, thank you so much for watching this video and checking this channel out. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to Life Study Library. Your support is much, much appreciated. And that's it from me today. You've been watching the Life Study Library, hosted by me, Lai Yosh, and I'll see you in another video. Bye!